Now, I'm really excited because we come to the, a break part of the service. It's all great, but this is an exciting bit because we get to hear directly from God through an amazing man in our church. Um, this guy preached for the first time not so long ago, a few weeks ago, and he has got a clear gift and anointing on his life. So I'm really excited to hear what God has spoken to him to share with us this morning. So please welcome Nathaniel Soderberg to the pulpit. <clears throat> Bless you. Thank you. Um, no pressure then. <laughs> Joe should have loaded up your iPad before we started. There we go. All right. Um, it's really funny. Me and me and Rod were chatting a few weeks ago, um, and one of the things he said, "It's always really difficult to know how to start a preach. Like, do you do you start with a joke? Um, do you just jump straight in? Like, how how should you actually start?" A preach, and I've I've always had the the same kind of idea. It's just how how do I actually start a, a, a preach? Um, I'm, I feel like I'm always a little bit awkward with it. Um, but I, I thought I'd start to, today. Um, I learned a new new skill uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, Sandy's laughing already. Um, I can now plait hair. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that was. Uh, it's, it's been a long, long time coming, but uh, yeah. So um, yeah, got got plaits all all sorted. Um, so uh, yeah, again, there was no real reason for me to share that apart from go go me. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, there we go. No, I'm not actually. That would have been a, a good link though. Uh, right. No, the, this morning, um, again, obviously we're carrying on the, the theme of expectation, um, and obviously over the last kind of couple, of couple of months, we've been looking at different aspects of that, um, and the last time I, I preached, we looked at uh, where our heart was and looking at the, the soil of our hearts, um, and are we positioned um, in, in the right way to, to receive the promises and, and the word of, of God. Um, and this morning, uh, we kind of looked at, well, last time I looked at kind of Mary uh, at the feet of, of Jesus. And this morning, um, I really felt um, God uh, speaking to me about another Mary. Uh, this is the mother of, of Mary and her encounter with uh, the angel Gabriel at the, the very start of um, that story. So Luke chapter 1 um, should be up on the screen or you can turn to your Bibles, obviously on your phones. Um, this is Luke chapter 1 starting at verse 26. <clears throat> and it says this, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Just going to stop there. Two things which kind of stuck out at me, and that was Gabriel obviously first arrived, and he says to her, greetings you who are highly favored, and then he repeats it, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. And the Bible doesn't obviously go into to much detail, kind of the, the back story with, uh, with Mary, um, so kind of reading but between the lines or kind of just looking at, at this, I think it's really interesting that Mary had this favor on her. That there was obviously something about Mary which drew the attention of heaven. That something caught God's eye in the way Mary was approaching her life or approaching 
God. And obviously we don't know too much about it, but in my previous preach, I spoke about our positioning and we are positioned to surrender. And I believe that Mary's heart was already in that place of surrender. That she was already seeking God. That she had this heart that was chasing God and pursuing God. And I do wonder as well what her prayers were. And I can almost sense that maybe Mary was actually standing or sitting in the presence of God praying, where is your Messiah? Where is this promised one? And so Mary has kind of set herself up where heaven, she's attracting heaven, she's attracting God's favor. And there's similarities to King David. Obviously, Debs, a couple of weeks ago, spoke about King David and how David, he was the forgotten son of Jesse. So when Samuel came to anoint the new king of Israel and he went to Jesse, where are your sons? Jesse had forgotten that he had another son that was out in the field tending the sheep. But there was something about King David that attracted heaven, that had attracted God. And we know that David was a worshiper and that he was a man after God's own heart. And again, what he did in the secret place when no one was watching, while he was um, watching over the sheep, he was already practicing that alignment and focus on God. That he already had this sense of I wanted to be, what I want to be with God. And so we have Mary here, and I believe, again, there's those similarities that she has positioned herself to attract the favor of heaven. And I think for us, God is constantly looking for the men and women who are positioning themselves to attract the favor of heaven. And I do believe that God is already, what he's doing in, uh, in the world today and, and in our churches is already raising up the men and women who are focused on prioritizing God and his presence. And I had a, a, a real sense as well about the importance of children. And that obviously we've got King David, who was a boy, and Mary, who wasn't that, um, who wasn't obviously a, a, that much older. Um, but they're attracting the favor of heaven. I think sometimes we can get so caught up that as adults, that God is looking at our hearts, and he 100% is, but actually... The importance of the children and us as a church, as parents, as people who look after children, the importance of helping them understand the importance of God's presence. And obviously we've, we've got the, the Gen Z, but now obviously we've got the, the Generation Alpha. What a name to be called, Generation Alpha. Um, so this is kind of anyone that's kind of 2010 onwards. And there is something about this new generation, Generation Alpha, that has a wildness about them. And there's been a few words about Generation Alpha being, being the wild ones. And I really had this kind of picture and sense that they're almost like the John the Baptist type generation. That these wild people that know the presence of God and will proclaim the Lord's coming, that will proclaim that it is time to turn. But God is looking for those people whose hearts are in alignment and surrendered to him. And again, just the importance obviously for us, but also for our children. So 
So the next part. Where are we? <clears throat> so Angel Gabriel, verse 31. Uh, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus, and he will be great and will be uh, called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So obviously, Angel Gabriel's come to, to Mary, and uh, he, he's talking with her, having this conversation. And obviously, he tells her all these uh, amazing things. And Mary, obviously very practical, how can this be? She asks the question. And I think there's something in this that when we have those promises over our lives, that it's okay to ask questions, that God isn't afraid of us asking questions. In fact, I think he invites us to ask questions. And so we, here we have Mary asking, how is this going to work? And interestingly, I think, obviously, Gabriel gives her this answer. If you actually read that, he doesn't really give her any details. Um, if you're anything like, like me, I definitely would have asked some more questions. Because if Gabriel had said that to me, I would have been like, well, that doesn't really answer my question. Like, how exactly is this going to happen? What does that look like? And if we think about this, and I think this is something, um, you know, we, we sometimes gloss over or, or miss out. But for Mary, who was engaged to be married, for her to be told by God, like given a promise, you're going to become pregnant in Jewish culture, for a woman and, and, and the law, for a woman to be pregnant outside of marriage could have led to her being stoned to death. And I think there's, there's something sometimes about words and promises which are given to us that, you know, we think about favor of God and we're like, yay, everything's all easy and simple um, and I've got this promise and I can just walk in it and it's great and it's easy. But actually sometimes the promises of God come with something which means that there is a, a sacrifice and exchange that is needed. That is not all sunshine and rainbows. And so we have Mary who's obviously given this promise and all these implications that, one, she could potentially be stoned to death. Two, what does that mean for the rest of her life, having a child outside of marriage? The implications for society, for her family, the potential shame all these things, and I think, you know, we would be asking these questions, well, what about this? What about that? What does that look like? I need a little bit more information. But Mary's response, and this is something which I think is really key, Mary's response. So if we skip down to verse 38, it says this, I I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left. 
I think sometimes when we receive a word from God, we have so many questions. And just like you know, the seed that is planted in the soil, we allow all the weeds and everything to suffocate the word because we're spending too much time thinking and questioning. And again, there's nothing wrong with asking those questions. It's okay to ask those questions. But when we get stuck in that place of questioning God, questioning the word, questioning, it suffocates the word. And we see this, if we skip back just um, into a couple of verses where we're looking at the, um, the birth of John the Baptist. And it says um, that Zechariah, who's having this conversation again with uh, the angel Gabriel, and Zechariah asks the question, but he asks the question with so much lack of faith and doubt, where he goes to Gabriel, I need a sign that what you're saying is going to happen. I mean, here he is standing talking to an angel who is telling these words, and you go, can you give me another sign? And the angel Gabriel then mutes him because he didn't believe. He mutes him. And that is, and again, I think there's something in that word where sometimes our words, there's life and death in our words, that sometimes we just need to be silent. Because if we keep going over it, keep questioning it, we end up killing the promise. We end up killing those words. And this is where Mary's response is so incredible. And again, this is what, you know, why heaven was attracted to her. Because her response is, here I am. Here I am. I am your servant. Again, God is looking over the earth for the people who are willing to stand up and say, here I am. Here I am. I am your servant. I think sometimes we can be a little bit too comfortable in our lives. That when we are, are comfortable, it's hard to step out because it can be scary, maybe it's inconvenient. And so the opportunity to say, I am your servant, is a lot harder to say because we are too comfortable. We're too focused on the things of this world. And I, I wrote this, if I can find it. Good to do, I've got two knees. There we go. I wrote this uh, word in, when was this? May 2023, uh, not 2003. That would be incredible if it was. Um, last year. And it says this, be prepared. The church has grown fat, feeding at the table of the world. We have become a powerless people, a faithless people, wrapped up in all the concerns of the world. We are too comfortable. God is asking, where is his bride? Where is her power? We are meant to be a city on a hill. Jesus is meant to be the desire of the nations. I hold my hands up. Because I think it's easy to fall into the trap of planning and thinking about your own life. What career you're going to do, who you're going to marry, how many kids do you have, where you're going to live. And these are important things, and God 100% cares about these things, deeply cares about these things. 
but it's where are our priorities. We are too comfortable with the world and the way the world thinks. It says in Haggai 1, um, verse 9, You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. There is something that we are missing, that we are so caught up with the world. And God is saying, are you going to return to me, reprioritizing your life around me, around my kingdom, around my church? A couple of weekends ago, we went down to uh, my wife's family. Um, and the kids were going a bit bit crazy, so I uh, ended up having to take them out outside, go for a little bit of a walk, just get some fresh air. And as we're, we're walking around the, the block, um, this one house catches my eye. Um, and as I, as I look up, um, there's this big window on the, the second floor, and in the window is this massive lion, um, like a, a, a teddy bear lion. Huge, great thing. So I'm saying to the girls, oh, look at, look at that uh, line in, in the window. Um, and then just underneath the, the windows, often houses do, they have the dates um, in, like in, in a brick. And the date of this house was 1913. And as I was kind of just looking at this, this house, I had this picture of this family who were sat around um, their, their floor. And, you know, when you move into a new house, you have all the boxes and everything and the, and the craziness of, of uh, moving into a new house. Um, but the excitement of this young family and making all the plans and, you know, being in their new house and all everything and uh, the, the future and the potential and, and, and all this exciting stuff. And then the Holy Spirit just said to me, what happened in 1914? Sometimes we can get so caught up with making our own plans that we forget to include God in it. That there is a bigger picture than just our everyday lives. Seek first his kingdom. God is calling us out. And when he calls us out, it is not comfortable. You know, it's Palm Sunday today, um, and there is this moment where Jesus, once he comes into Jerusalem, and he goes to the temple, and he starts throwing all the money changers and throwing everything upside down in the temple. And he says, my house is a house of prayer. And one of the things, and I just heard this recently, one of the things that um, Jesus probably would have um, knocked over would have, because they would have been selling doves. And the doves would have been locked in cages. And Jesus would have knocked all that stuff open. And maybe there were doves and everything all over the place. What does a dove represent? Holy Spirit. I think sometimes we lock the Holy Spirit up into this little cage and we go, we like you, we appreciate you, but we don't want you to make us feel too uncomfortable. Again, we are meant to be a city on a hill. The Bible says that we are meant to be aliens in this world, that our friends, our non-Christian friends, family, colleagues, they should all look at you and go, you're different. You are 
different. I think it is so, so easy for us to just be nice people. And that actually, God isn't asking us to just be nice people. He is asking us, he is commanding us to be people who are full of his spirit and who walk out in power and authority. Is there much difference between you and your non-Christian friends and family and colleagues? Are you more generous than some of your non-Christian friends and family? Is there something about you which makes people question, maybe there is a God. Maybe there is a God that loves me, that cares for me, that wants to know me. I had a, a, a good, what is a, a good quote, um, which if you're heading in a direction and you're following Jesus, but you're not experiencing, um, but everything is, is easy, then maybe you're not actually following Jesus. Jesus didn't make us for the comfortable. He didn't call us into the comfortable. He called us into the uncomfortable. He called us to take risks, to be so reliant on him and not ourselves. If we were to take the Holy Spirit away from the programs that we run, everything that we deliver, would we notice? God is calling us up. He is calling us out. He says we are meant to be going from glory to glory. Our faith is meant to be increasing. I'm a a fitness professional. Um, Some of you don't know. Um, And one of the things we we always talk about is your comfort zone. And if you want to get fitter and stronger, you can't remain and stay doing the same thing. You can't just stay with what you are comfortable with because you don't get fitter that way. If you've never been running before, the only way that you can run is to actually go outside and go for a run. If you want to get stronger, the only way to get stronger is to lift a slightly heavier weight. The same is true about our faith, about what we are expectant for. That cannot grow if we just remain where we are. If we remain in the comfortable and the known. Your level of growth will be determined by the greatness of your God. If you have a small God, then you'll have small faith and you will operate from a place of lack rather than being backed by the full weight of heaven. How big is the God that we serve? 
to invite the band up. So just as I start to, to wrap up, I'm going to read a passage from, from Revelations. And for us just to really reflect on the passage I'm about to, to read, how big is our God? And this is Revelations 1, verse 12. This is John writing about Jesus. He says this, I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was as white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. This, this is our Jesus. This is the God we serve. As we enter into this time of, of worship, I really felt there were two types of people that God was wanting to speak to today. First one, those that are ready and wanting to say to Jesus, here I am, send me. I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to be your servant. I'm ready to be your hands and feet. I no longer want to stick with the status quo. And the second person I really felt God was wanting to, to speak to today was if you find it difficult to hear from God, if you believe that God doesn't really speak to you, I believe there is an opportunity this morning, right now, for God to just blow that lie away, that there is a release of the Word of God over each of us, an opening of our ears and our hearts to be able to hear His Word, to receive His promises. So if you feel like you're ready to surrender to, to God, I want you to come up. And also if you feel like you want in prayer, to have your ears and hearts opened and those words from God, then I want you to, to come up. We've got our, our prayer team that will be 